I actually had quite a different talk planned, and uh, I ended up in a conversation with uh, Craig Wright uh, a couple of weeks ago, and as he is one to do, he just dropped a couple of offhand comments which completely changed what I was going to do. So I had to scrap the whole thing and rewrite it. So um, it's not as pretty as, as I would have liked, but um, uh, I think the information in it is, is really great. So uh, I called it 42. Um, so in, in 1979, Douglas Adams published The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, in which he revealed that 42 is the answer to life, the universe, and everything. And this number keeps cropping up in all kinds of interesting places, and Bitcoin is no different. So it's also the number of a key Bitcoin white paper called Secret Value Distribution, which, as I hope to show you today, can provide us with new and more simple ways to manage user privacy. So 42 is also 10 more than 32. And as a lot of you would know, BIP32 is the Bitcoin improvement proposal that almost all wallets used today employ. It sits at the roots of, of, at the root of current methods used to create keychains, but its somewhat simplistic approach adds complexity and makes identity services much harder to establish and manage. So what I'm proposing today is a new means of establishing relationships between users and services that handles identity management through shared secrets. So a user would first create an identity key, which would typically be a derivative of a higher level key that is also controlled by that same user but which may or may not ever be used in an on-chain action. The user uses this identity key to establish an identity profile with a, an identity service provider. The provider would be given a superset of that user's information, possibly including things like name, address, date of birth, and more. And the user and the identity information service then collaborate using secret sharing to create a service anchor. And this anchor would contain signed information from the identity service that, in this example, would verify a user's age, country of residence, and possibly an alias. So the pub key of that service anchor now serves as a device to generate shared secrets between different services with whom that level of information from that, particularly, from that particular identity information service is considered acceptable. So keychain routes can be established using the techniques from white paper 42. The user generates a shared secret using their private key from the service anchor and a service's public key. So this means that a service can use a single static public key to accept incoming connections from an unbounded number of users. The information exchange can be on-chain or off-chain and uh, this allows the service to respond to each user on an IP address that's d d directly connected to the shared secret using cryptographically generated addresses. This means that users can always be certain that they're talking to the right service while maintaining their on-chain privacy and protecting their identity. So because the user's information service holds a superset of that user's information, that user can now create separate service anchors which are configured each for classes of service that require different subsets of their overall persona. In this way, a service anchor could be created and used to define a wallet handle, which a wallet service provider would be allowed to create with verification of the user's age and country of residence, but a, 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 the same identity key and identity information service can be used to establish a separate service anchor, which might be for a telecommunications device activation, which requires more information, such as a name, an address, and an age. So a user is also able to establish several separate identity keys to allow for separation of aliases. These identities can contain different details and serve different purposes. In this way, a user could create an identity key that they register with an identity service that their work environment requires, but which is altogether separate from their social media or online profile. And once a service anchor has been created, 
between a user and a, a wallet or a handle service, it effectively becomes a static representation of that user's handle with its own key pair, which that user can then easily use to connect to any services that have integrated that particular handle uh, service's payment technology. And each time the user reaches out to a new service from their anchor, a new shared keychain can be established between that service and the user. This maintains user privacy for almost any use case. Now, using these techniques, we've now created a system where a legal action can connect a particular handle being used in a particular service to a real person by compelling that identity information service to provide additional information about that user for the purposes of litigation. In this way, the identity information service can now provide details of a user's identity without compromising publicly their handle. So to establish a service with a third party, the user would first reach out uh, via that service's pub key and a cryptographically generated IP address and provide their own pub key and handle. The user and the service would use the techniques in Patent 42 to establish a keychain root address which is shared between the user and the service. And from this, this keychain root can be used to generate IPv6 addresses for both the user and the service, so they can have multiple IPv6 addresses that they communicate with, um, and used as a basis to generate different keychains of all kinds. So this might be private to each side, shared between both, but in all cases, uh, protect user privacy and security. So a keychain can be generated to manage a particular type of token or a purchase type within a wallet, uh, or to manage social media posting, uh, or really any kind of app or service that you would like. So um, now I wanted to get into a little bit what this means uh, for MetaNet protocol and how we can uh, use this to improve uh, or uh, create new ways of uh, lodging content with approval processes. And so um, you can use these as a means to build information in a MetaNet DAG while maintaining the privacy of purpose and managing signing actions effectively. So in this very simple example, we have a user who is solving an R puzzle with MetaNet keys from the parent node uh, that they are linking to. So this allows the complete disassociation of the spending coin from the node in the graph itself, giving a user flexibility to extend the MetaNet graph as needed without requiring a complicated UTXO management framework within their wallet. The R puzzle is used to solve the script pub key for the coin being spent, while the key pair used in the R puzzle signature sign and validate the MetaNet node data in the transaction output. This technique is space efficient and is quite straightforward, and it allows MetaNet builders to minimize the number of transaction outputs they generate while also uh, removing current dependencies on so-called op return outputs. So now it's important to note when managing R puzzle keys that the K and R values used in the creation of R puzzles use the same numeric range and mathematics as public-private key pairs used in elliptic curve keys and signatures, meaning that the techniques that I described in the previous slides are also applicable to R puzzle K chains. What an R puzzle gives us is the ability to solve an input puzzle with a known K value from one keychain while signing the MetaNet data with a separate MetaNet key pair from its own keychain all within the same signature. So this can be further extended to allow for sophisticated MetaNet content approval processes. So in this example, we have a MetaNet node that is being created with an approval process requiring a separate two of three multi-signature authorization. The artist creates their solution to the inputs R puzzle, but signs it with the MetaNet key from the parent node. This partially signed transaction including the new content, is then passed to an approval panel, two of three of whom must sign off on the transaction for it to be spent extending the MetaNet graph. Each user's keychain can be established from a root hub, which 
can also be the root of the MetaNet graph that they are approving. In this way, a set of private keychains can be created which link content generators and approvers back to the original creation event for the MetaNet DAG being worked on. Different approvers can be added or removed, to the hub, uh, removed from the hub, allowing for custody handover processes which respect the privacy and rights of all participants. So looking at this a bit more in depth, here we see the full transaction. So at the top, we have the script SIG. I don't know if you can see the, the laser pointer, but that's the script SIG there at the top. Um, the blue element is the UTXO's script pub key. So that's the coin that we're spending. The green is the new UTXO that's being generated, which contains the MetaNet node that's being written into the DAG. So the MetaNet node is, creating, is created using the pub key from the parent node to sign the R puzzle for the input being spent. So basically, this signature uses this R value to solve this R puzzle. Hang on a second. So the R puzzle itself solves the script for the input UTXO, allowing the artist to dissociate the spending of the coin from the MetaNet update action being performed. So we sign the R puzzle with R, we sign the MetaNet transaction with the Meta signature and Meta public key from this Meta transaction. So by inserting code separators into this script, we can now isolate pieces of the script pub key, allowing each signing party to specifically select what piece of the input they want to sign. So in this example, the two parties providing signatures for the multi-signature approval process only sign the part of the input relating to their signature, which is shown in red. This means that the MetaNet data contained within the UTXO that is being spent is excluded from the message hash that they sign. The second code separator allows the artist to sign their part of the script without having to re-sign the MetaNet node contained within the input that they are spending, effectively giving all participants granular clarity on exactly what they are applying their signatures to. SIG hash types allow us to go further, giving users the ability to select which part of or parts of the overall transaction they're signing. So using SIG hash all or SIG hash single in this example would allow the approvers to sign off on the, meta, on the new MetaNet node being generated. However, they also have the ability to sign using SIG hash none, effectively allowing this coin to be spent without any visibility of what is being pushed into the output. So that would be in a case where maybe the artist is leaving, they want their coin back, they can just release that coin without having to sign any new information about it. So SIG hash, uh, so these tools and opcode separator give us a very extensive toolbox to ensure that all Bitcoin users can be very specific about exactly what they sign when they use Bitcoin. And uh, so that's, that's my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.